Good evening. Let me first thank the CFA Institute and its organizer for inviting me to speak at this uh, very interesting conference. It's both a pleasure and an honor to be here and talking to you. Before I actually start with the evaluation, let me say a few words about myself and a few general comments that might uh, help uh, understand you what I'm going to say. I'm currently a professor of finance at uh, De Vinci University in Paris. <coughs> Before, I, I taught a number of universities. started in Genova, at the University of Genova, engineering. I'm an engineer by training. Then I went to a deck in Nice, uh, then I went to the US, uh, to New York University, Stony Brook, I taught at Princeton, and now in Paris. In Genova, some 20 years ago, we created an interdisciplinary research center joining forces between engineering, physics, and economics. And the theme, the themes of uh, uh, this, uh, this research center have been the underlying themes of my research for all this uh, period. Well, what, what did we try to achieve? Essentially two things. The first uh, is to understand both finance theory and economics uh, as, uh, in its true complexity, as a set of diverse, diverse uh, interacting agents. Economics is not an homogeneous thing. It's something which is intrinsically, that intrinsically has uh, a structure. If you forget about the structure, not only you make mistakes, uh, but you make mistakes conceptually. Many of the concepts uh, that are currently used uh, essentially do not apply to, uh, let's, say, um, inter let's say, interacting complex systems. I will, I will show you a few examples later. But we also had another idea. <laughs> the idea was uh, what has been called uh, with the horrible name econophysics. And the idea is to bring, uh, let's say, the method of science to economics. Now, let's make sure that we understand immediately, uh, to dispel immediately a misunderstanding. Bringing science to economics and to finance does not mean to bring more mathematics. Actually, it's the opposite. There are a number of interesting anecdotes uh, on uh, how, uh, for example, physicists use as little mathematics as they can, while economics, economists do the opposite. For example, if you read a book by complexity, an interesting book about, uh, about Santa Fe, and uh, there is a, an anecdote at a conference organized in Santa Fe. They brought together the um, leading economists of the time, it was some um, 15 years ago, and including Kenneth Arrow, and the physicists from Los Alamos laboratories. You know, Los Alamos, where they make the atomic bombs. And after a few days, I mean, the physicists listening to these presentations, they asked uh, Arrow, but why on earth you use all this mess? You don't have the data. You, you, there's no way that you can prove. And, uh, and the answer of Arrow was interesting. He thought a little bit, you know, Arrow is an imposing individual. No? And he said, well, you use uh, complex mathematics just because you do not have data. Uh, we have to make sure that we do things correctly. And that's a problem. Um, economics is very often, financier as well, reasoning about something which is in the head of the economist, not in reality. What we really need is to go back to a more pragmatic view and understanding that science is about data. Now, if you are a botanist, you don't use much mathematics. Still, you have a lot of scientific knowledge. And anyone who has tried to grow a vegetable garden knows that you need some scientific knowledge to grow a good vegetable garden. Still, it's not mathematics. Mathematics is a language. It's very complex, it's very precise. Life and reality often is not so precise. So you need a type of flexibility which the language like the Ukrainian language or the Italian language or the English language offer you, still in, with respect to logic. But you need to root everything in data. Observations, that's the, the name of the game. Science has become operational. It took hundreds of years, before, so it was kind of a refinement of intuition. Today, science is no longer a refinement of intuition. You know, children ask, mom, mom, do I have pain in the belly? As if mom knows if they have pain in the belly. Much of science used to be like, like that. What is the true meaning of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, information? But information theory does not solve this problem. Information theory is something that gives you a theory about a certain type of observations, how they, they, they behave. So this is the type of discipline that we should bring to finance. If not, we keep on discussing things that have no relationship with, with the reality. There is an interesting anecdote again. Queen Elizabeth in 2009 uh, visited the London, London School of Economics. 
She had already lost some 25 million dollars of personal money, but she has a little bit of money. In, during the crisis, no? <coughs> and she visited the London School of Economics. Can you imagine no? all the professors there, all well dressed? And at a certain point, the queen, you know, the queen never explains, never complains, but asks questions. So she said, uh, she asked, but why on, did, you did not uh, foresee the, the crisis? I mean, she had an interest. Uh, and why you don't offer uh, solutions? And again, they, we are a little bit uh, disturbed. So they took time, and uh, some 10 days later, they f crafted a, an answer, which you can find on the uh, internet. And the answer was essentially, well, you know, we did not uh, <coughs> foresee the crisis because the actual economics does not foresee crisis. I mean, crises are not part of uh, economics. I mean, we are in an equilibrium framework. I really do expect to have a crisis in an equilibrium framework. That's the type of problem. Okay, and we'll see on valuations because first thing that you have to ask is what, the, what on earth is valuation is. So let's start. So <coughs> fundamental analysts try to, uh, to determine the intrinsic value of a company. Does it make sense? We'll discuss it. And uh, under the assumption that they are able to, sorry, that they are able to estimate the difference between a fundamental value of its stock and its actual market value, they try to form portfolios so that uh, they buy under undervalued stocks and under the assumption that these undervalued stocks uh, will uh, reach the, 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 the true intrinsic value. Is that true? Studies uh, show that on average, traditional managers do not, uh, let's say, tra active traditional managers do not perform the market. And uh, the results, as you see, a sea of changes in investors' preferences. Now lots of funds shift from active to passive investment. They say, well, in the end, why pay so much for an active investment if active investment does, does perform? So what is all about this valuation? If you have a house, you don't expect the house to have an intrinsic value. If there is a lot of demand, the value of your house goes up. If uh, there is not much uh, demand, the value of the house goes down. Now, public shares are traded in markets which are in principle competitive. And they are subject to the law of supply and demand. So, what is the idea of an intrinsic value of a stock? Why should the stock have an intrinsic value Why, well, when uh, cars and uh, knives uh, and uh, houses do not have intrinsic values? Or can we determine only relative values? Uh, other questions. Uh, um, how do we determine the value of uh, things such as IPOs where we really don't have much information? Or uh, what is the role of uh, hype in all this process? And then uh, fundamental. No, sorry. Uh, 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 how do I get to go back? How do I go back? No. Can someone help uh, to go back? Uh, in disasters. No. Okay. No. No. Okay. Thanks. Or can we determine only? Uh, And very important, how do we um, understand, pro let's say, the effect of, of policies by central banks? When I talk about uh, complexity, this is the first point. When I talked about complexity, one of the main themes of complexity is the interaction of the banking system with financial markets and with the real economy. And that's the fundamental missing point. If you look at economics as a neoclassical neo economics, uh, all these very complicated dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, stochastic differential equations, agent optimality, Pontryagin in principle, all these type of things. There is no financial system. There is no banking system. But the banking system is fundamental because it what creates money. Sorry, it's what creates money. I mean, the money creation process is one of the things that people don't understand. 
not even professionals. But uh, money is created in two ways, fundamentally. When people take loans and when the central banks create quantitative easing. Today, tomorrow might change. But money is fundamental, it's what creates economic power, it's what creates purchasing power. So money, it's an essential point. So does it have a role? Probably yes. Um, also, has the global investment universe changed? I mean, the end, the valuation, stock valuation, it's an old, uh, it's an old stuff. I mean, Graham and Dodd, even before. Has something fundamental changed? Can we say that something has fundamentally changed? New information, new ways of trading, different things. Um, are there new, different ways of generating returns, different from valuation? And ultimately, is valuation needed? You know, there are now, you read, uh, you read uh, uh, reports about uh, new companies, new ideas. There are uh, Japanese companies that uh, use satellite data to capture uh, uh, let's say the heat, the, the, the data about the, the, the light in cities, I mean, to understand uh, where there is more economic activity. Is that uh, something that uh, really will have an, uh, an impact? So these are uh, some of the questions that uh, we consider. Um, what did we do? Ma, uh, we reviewed the literature, extensive articles, and we interviewed some uh, 30 asset managers and academics uh, and other industry players, especially in North America and Europe. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we don't have much exposure to the, to the Far East, China, and uh, we don't have the data. Um, okay, so we limit the discussion to some of the key points. I mean, there in the, the monograph is available and you can... Now, uh, Fundamental analysis is a supporting pillar of uh, um, the notion of intrinsic value of a company stock. You, you perform a fundamental analysis to understand how the company works, I mean the balance sheets, etc., to understand the, the company stocks. The question of equity valuation, it's, very, it's very closely related to the question of market efficiency. Um, okay, here we, we are supposed to, to let's say, to be practical, to give practical uh, uh, advices, but uh, essentially you need some theory to understand valuation and to, to work with valuation. If you want, the main conclusions of uh, our work uh, is twofold. First, uh, in practice, valuation, as you practice current, currently, can only give you relative valuation. If uh, you really want to understand uh, absolute valuation, how the stock prices is against uh, let's say, some sort of intrinsic value, then you need a totally different uh, type of uh, considerations, and essentially you need macroeconomic considerations, as we, as we will see. Um, now, as often, you start with something that seems absolutely obvious. I mean, Graham and Dodd, uh, the, the, the great uh, writers of uh, uh, valuations, I mean, his advice, I mean, they gave lots of uh, uh, interesting hints on how to analyze, uh, to analyze companies. And it seems uh, quite reasonable. I mean, you have to select your investments. So what do you do? You analyze how the company is doing. You analyze the balance sheets. You analyze uh, uh, the financial situation of the company. You analyze their, uh, the sectors in which they work. I mean, the prospective, uh, the research and development they have, how the sector is, is working, potential uh, political problems, things like that. So. Seems, seems quite obvious, no? But the big uh, jump forward, the big conceptual leap, uh, which is not uh, at all uh, obvious, is to go from there to the notion of intrinsic price. Um, now, if you take uh, the classical APT asset pricing theory, the financial asset prices are the sum of in the, as the absence of arbitrage. If there, are, there is arbitrage, then there is no single price, and then you cannot say anything. But if a market, in the absence of arbitrage, the financial, the, the, the price of an asset is just the sum of discounted value of expected future cash flows. Any financial asset is a contract that gives you the right to receive a future stream of cash flows. That's true for stocks, for bonds, for anything. And its price is essentially the sum of discounted values, eventually with a, a, market, with a risk premium. 
We also know that you can change the probability distribution so that all assets in this new risk-neutral probability distributions have the same return as the risk-free return. But essentially, yeah, future cash flows, and that's important, plus um, uh, the uh, risk-free rates and the risk premium. But what is the intrinsic price? The intrinsic price corresponds to the natural rate of return at which supply and demand are in equilibrium. So essentially, what we are trying to achieve when you try to find the intrinsic price is to find a macroeconomic situation where there is no excess of demand over the offer of our investment or insufficient demand. Because if demand is insufficient or excessive, you have a non-stationary situation. You have a market that is not in equilibrium. The intrinsic price is just the quest for an equilibrium situation. In fact, you have a parallel framework, which is the framework of um, market efficiency. Market efficiency was uh, started by Eugene Fama in 1970. And he said something that apparently looks so, so, so simple and so interesting. Market is efficient if stock prices fully reflect uh, all available information. What does it mean? Nothing. It means that prices should reflect some theoretical price. But what is a theoretical price? I mean, price is what it is. And you can explain price, market price, in terms of expected cash flows and um, returns. The intrinsic price is the price in situation of equilibrium. So the job of an analyst is to discover whether a financial asset is mispriced. That is, under or overpriced with respect to this intrinsic value. Now, the identification of uh, ability to take advantage of mispricings are believed to generate profit under the assumptions that markets will revert, that prices will revert to their intrinsic value, which is a daring assumption. <clears throat> so, though, though markets are driven by supply and demand, so potentially in situations of non-equilibrium, it is still believed that prices will revert to this equilibrium situation. Now, free markets, as we said, there is no price is determined by the interaction of supply and demand, and possibly with important links between the characteristics of things and their price. And that's, again, it's one of the things that I mentioned before, complexity. Uh, it's not obvious uh, how prices are formed, even in markets. Um, incidentally, when you talk about free markets, uh, free markets are free only partially. Coes, who got the Nobel Prize, uh, made clear in 1937 and later, he was a, almost a student, that actually markets uh, are free only at the periphery, I mean, as consumers, but actually most of the economic activity takes place inside where big corporations, either governments or big corporations. Now, big corporations are everything but free markets. They are command economies. So you have sub-command economies that live in a milieu of, of, let's say, of free consumers, but, I mean, the economic activity is largely driven by command economies. Um, okay, now, the real, the real stuff, uh, it's uh, almost free from arbitrage, whether it's true or not, uh, it's questionable. If you try to buy a seat in a, in a plane, you have different prices for the same seat, but financial assets, no. In principle, you really have the, the ideas that are most, uh, almost competitive. If you really want to understand the notion of, uh, of intrinsic price, of, uh, let's say, of intrinsic value, it's uh, a notion related to macroeconomic considerations. It's a purely conceptual notion. It's the notion that you try to find that price at which demand and offer will be in, uh, in equilibrium. And uh, therefore, if you want to determine the intrinsic value of a stock, You have to determine the distribution of future cash flows, which is already a daring uh, task, but above all, the true interest rates and the true risk premium. 
Now, the idea of a natural rate, uh, natural risk premium, natural rate uh, of risk, goes back to a genius in, in, in economics, Knut Wicksell. Knut Wicksell was one of the first to understand that uh, first credit, credit generates demand. Now it's something that everybody more or less uh, accepts. Credit generates money, through money you generate demand. Knut Wicksell was one of the first to, to understand this, uh, this point. And introduced the idea that uh, there is a natural rate of, of interest, and the natural rate of interest is the rate at which there is equilibrium between demand and supply, supply and demand. But of course, I mean, as we will see, that's a very uh, difficult, difficult subject. We will see central banks are trying now to understand that point because, I mean, they, they, they really try to understand if they can model this, but it's, it's not an easy, an, easy, an easy subject. Much of the literature on uh, uh, valuation, if you read anything about the valuation, they spend a lot of time trying to understand how to forecast uh, future dividends or future cash flows, but very little time in trying to understand the, 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 what is the fundamental point, the rate, because it, it exceeds completely the domain of finance. Um, as we will see, then the, there are other considerations such as uh, uh, asset pricing models, factor models, all these things. But uh, all these things uh, miss the fundamental point that you need some ability to price uh, stocks on the basis of the real effective uh, capacity of, of, of firms that go to work. Uh, no. So in practice, the only thing you can do is to make a relative valuation. And that's reasonably possible. You can make relative valuation to understand if a company is better than another one. Now, whether the market will effectively understand that or not, it's, a, it's questionable. But essentially, you can somehow understand if a company has a better ability to generate future cash flows than another company. So reasonably, you can make a relative valuation to make a real uh, absolute evaluation to understand if a stock is cheap or dear with respect to an intrinsic price, it uh, requires, I mean, totally different uh, considerations, requires essentially uh, macroeconomic considerations. So, uh, when you models that, uh, and we have seen before, uh, used to compute uh, the net present value requires two steps, forecast your future cash flows and estimation. Now, the forecast of future cash flows is typically based on the analysis of the, uh, of the firm, no? on the fundamental analysis, which is a, a model of the future the projections of future cash flows. And you can understand that it's extremely difficult. How can you really forecast how much, how much cash will uh, Microsoft produce 20 years from now? You don't even know if it will exist or not. I mean, it seems something which is totally outside of, uh, of the realm of, of, of realistic possibilities. Again, it's important to understand that uh, if we don't know something, we don't know something. Very often you read uh, and you, you hear some people say, science does not explain everything. Okay, fine. And so what? You cannot jump to certainty just because you want to jump to certainty. You have to accept the things you don't know. There are things that you don't know. Now, that you really know how much a company Will, how much cash a company will produce 20, 30 years from now, uh, it's, a, let's say, a daring, a daring statement. Um, so in practice, uh, uh, okay, fine, we have uh, already said this. So there are essentially different uh, ways of approaching the problem. Uh, discount dividend models and uh, discounted cash flow models. I mean, you can adopt one of two they can adopt other, other ways, but you can either, let's say, model the future dividends or you can model the actual free cash, really what is free cash, whether it's distributed or not. So we have the discounted cash flows model and the distributed. Now, um, the discounted dividend model has two problems. You have first really to forecast the ability of the company to, to, to produce cash, to produce uh, returns, but you also have to model the willingness of the management to distribute uh, that, uh, that cash, especially if you are talking about, uh, 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 let's say, relative short periods of time. 
So people uh, that prefer dividend discount model typically it's typically used where in mature industries where you have a history where you know more or less how people how management will uh, will will behave and so you can you can somehow project uh, your your dividend. Um, the idea of uh, uh, discounted cash flow model uh, it's uh, the, uh, the idea that in reality what is really important is cash flows. It's the cash, not not how much cash is distributed, but how much cash really the company is able to create. And uh, here, I mean, there are a number of, as we said, I mean, the, the, the monograph is based on, on interviews, no? Um, here is a, say, a comment by a Denmark's largest pension provider. They say, all models shed light on some aspect of the truth. They all have their pros. On the margin, we favor the free cash flow model, essentially because uh, uh, cash flow models are less prone to manipulation. Dividends are always prone to manipulation. So the insight here, I mean, the price of a stock reflects essentially the real cash, not how much of this cash is distributed. In some cases, no cash, is this no dividend distributed, but still, I mean, the price of the company. Um, what is the free cash? It's the cash flows, I mean, the real cash flows, minus the allowance for enough investment to keep the company in the state, steady state, replacing, um, let's say, equipment, etc. Now, what are the challenges? Clearly, uh, forecasting. How do you forecast these, uh, these things? How do you forecast uh, uh, how much a company will produce in terms of, uh, of cash uh, in five or 10 years from now, or 15 or 20 years from now? It's basically, it's basically it's a, very, it's a very challenging task. I mean, you can say what you want, but I mean, really, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to, to produce. Uh, in practice, uh, therefore, model, uh, you have a, ter let's say, discounted cash flows, both discounted cash flows model or discount dividend models work only on the limited time horizon. So you forecast the cash flow for a certain time of period, and then you have the residual value. But again, uh, it's, not, it's not uniform, it's not a law of nature. Different industries have very different uh, uh, terminal values. For example, Let's take uh, one of our interviewees, uh, Charles Lee, notes, uh, I mean, in a mature sector, let's say tobacco industry, over an eight-time-year eight time frame, the residual value represents 56% of the total present value. In the skin care sector, the terminal value, that is after eight years, is the, the, the totality of the value, because, I mean, you, you need an investment initially. In high-tech sector, things of Tesla, uh, the first eight years of a firm yield a negative value. Now, are these laws of nature? No. Uh, these are just um, statistical, uh, statistical regularity, which are what they are. I mean, they might change. It depends on uh, lots of uh, different, uh, different things. I mean, how much technology you really uh, need. Uh, in lots, uh, lots of different considerations. So it's, it's a very difficult, difficult, difficult uh, sector. Um, okay, this we said again, uh, you need to determine the, the interest rate. I mean, what interest rate do you use? Now, central banks are increasingly, I mean, who can shed light on this problem? Central banks. Central banks are increasingly interested in the idea of what is the real natural interest rates. Interest rates are now extremely low. And so central banks begin to ask, I mean, what they should, should they be? And a number of uh, people have started developing models to understand natural interest rates. The most uh, widely diffused is the Laubach and Williams model, developed by the Sendai Federal Reserve. Um, in this model, you have the natural rate, which is assumed to depend on the estimated contemporaneous trend growth of uh, output, which is a problem in itself. Eh? plus a time-varying uh, unobserved component. Uh, it's a hidden variable that uh, captures some, uh, some future, uh, some, some facts. And you estimate the model using Kalman filters, which is a standard technique uh, to uh, estimate, uh, to estimate uh, uh, models with the, hidden, with the hidden variables. Now, <coughs> what might change uh, uh, 
net present value models. There are a number of, uh, of things that really uh, have an effect. One of the, of the first uh, uh, important uh, um, if you want, uh, um, effects uh, that you might have on uh, discount, uh, discounted dividend models are uh, buybacks. Bu buybacks are related to a number of uh, factors, including um, probably, I mean, feds, the fact that people, but especially the, ex the availability of cash of companies. Uh, if you look at, uh, I mean, the traditional model is that companies need uh, loans to finance their operation. And this perhaps was true in the 50s. Now it's the, the, the circuit model of money. Companies go, finance their operations through loans, and then uh, get money back when they sell their products. But today companies are very cash rich. If you look, for example, if you look at the, the data from the Federal Reserve Bank of the US, I mean, right here, I mean, we published a book in uh, two months from now for Rutledge, just on money. And there are all these data. Um, if you look at the, the, the data of the in-depth deadness, that, the, the distribution of debt in the US, but in Europe is more or less the same thing. For example, you have companies are indebted for something like $2 trillion. Individuals are indebted for something like $4 trillion to buy houses. Joe Doe, eh? people like me. Some two trillion dollars to buy cars. 1.5 trillion dollars to buy education, students' loans. More than one trillion dollars for just uh, uh, consu consumer items, consumption items. The reality is that uh, money today is created by Joe Doe. Joe Doe is, uh, I don't know you say in Ukrainian, but it's the average individual. No? Money is created when someone takes a loan. No? The money generation process, it's a, it's, a, it's, a man, it's a process where banks create loans. I mean, the whole idea was that uh, you need a deposit to create, uh, to, 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 to make loans. And there was the whole idea of the multiplier. No, it's wrong. Today, the banking system works in a totally different way. Essentially, the, the cash created by the central banks, uh, you cannot even buy it directly. You need the first bank account. It's, 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 uh, the central bank cannot finance the state, cannot, for, for, cannot supply cash you know, to, to anyone. So the current model of creating, of creation of money is, uh, there are two essential, two, essentially two different ways. First, people take loans. And the bank create the loans out of nothing. They create a pair, loans, and, and deposit. So the system creates money uh, without any, any, virtually without any limits, except, uh, let's say, risk, uh, risk management considerations. But essentially, there are no, no, no limits. So cash is created in this way. This has created a huge amount of uh, available cash. Now companies are net lenders. They are not le net borrowers. And this excess of cash has created a uh, willingness to buy back stocks. Now, the point is that uh, money regards buybacks as a substitute of dividends. And for example, Strail and Ibotson, in an article in 2015, argues that the shift in corporate payment policies from uh, dividends to buybacks has created a fundamental change in, in, in valuation. Uh, companies use their cash not to distribute to, to, to shareholders, but to buy back sh stocks. And this has enormous effect on uh, uh, valuation, because I mean, it changes completely the structure of valuation. And at a large extent, this is essentially the result of the enormous availability of cash that today, I mean, if you take a, a comp company like Apple sits on $250 billion, just of cash. Add to this uh, what is called today financialization. So the creation of what is called the shadow banking system. Now the shadow banking system is uh, uh, a system unregulated that works, uh, which has the total volume, which is at some moment has been higher than the total volume of the regular banking system. 
and creates all uh, uh, um, products uh, such as repo, such as repurchasing agreement, uh, such as uh, uh, money market funds. And there are, if you are interested, there are interesting articles something on this, uh, on this, on this phenomenon. This has completely create, has completely changed the flow of money, the global flow of money from its creation from the banking system to injections in the in the in the, in the, in the economy, because much of this money ends up with credit products, essentially packages of short-term credit products uh, with enormous, uh, uh, you know, consequences on the economy, on finance, and other things. In particular, this uh, availability of cash has completely changed the policy. It's completely, I mean, it's changing. And according to Strahl and Dibson, in a very substantial way, has changed the, um, the payout, I mean, the, the, the policies of companies from paying dividends to buying back uh, stocks. Um, Actually, there is a dearth of stocks today, and uh, the, the number of available stocks has been reduced, you know, at least in the U.S. And for this reason, there is a shift from uh, uh, standard uh, discount dividend models and discounted cash flow models to what are called residual income models, which are created on, uh, let's say, which are based on the value creation instead of uh, uh, cash distribution. Now, okay, given that uh, um, it's so difficult to make uh, valuation, and that valuation can only be relative valuations, because if you want to make, as we said, absolute valuations, if you really want to understand if uh, uh, the market is overvalued or undervalued, many shift to uh, essentially uh, market multiples. So market multiples are essentially used to determine the price uh, of, uh, of an asset relative to a price of a similar comparable assets. So, I mean, essentially, uh, this type of models establish a ranking of asset values. Now, as we'll see later, and then let's anticipate this, there are new techniques, there is a lot of uh, new ideas uh, based on the availability of, of models on how to create uh, similar companies. The creation of similarity can be done automatically through models such as clustering. So you can create, uh, you can try to better, to have a better insight in how to group together companies that are somehow similar, because how, how, can, you, how can you define similar companies? I mean, in principle, one can say, okay, from the, cash, the future cash flows, but this is a circular argument. I mean, you're trying to avoid the, the, the future cash flows. So essentially, you need to determine a kind of uh, uh, distance between companies. And based on this distance, you can try to cluster companies using the norm, the, the may, one of the many clustering methods that are currently available to create clusters of similar companies where you can effectively apply uh, let's say, the notion of, of ranking. It's everything but simple because uh, actually you have to cluster in function of your objective. Again, and let's, uh, let's uh, make uh, things clear once more. I mean, every time you, you work, uh, every time you create a model, and I think uh, someone said it, uh, you have really to understand the objective of the model. You cannot model without... Uh, uh, knowing what, 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 you want, what you want. Just clustering does not make sense if you don't really understand what you want, for, for what reason you want to cluster. In this case, you want to cluster in function to understand uh, the evaluation of the company. But let's make it clear. Uh, you're not interested in a static evaluation of a company. The exercise is really to understand the future, evalu the future evolution of evaluation. You're not interested really in how much a company is valued today, because this is, I mean, you go to the market. You really understand if uh, this valuation is going to change, and if the change in valuation will create a change in the price of the company, because you are inter interested in understanding if there is, there is a, a return opportunity, if there is some, some, some opportunities for, for, for trading. Everything you do in finance uh, is essentially related to forecasting. You are never interested only in what is happening today. You're interested in what uh, 
will, will happen later. And what will happen to the future, at the future uh, stage? For example, the use of all these uh, factor models from CAPRAM to, these are static models. Are models where you take the returns at the same time of the, of, of the, of the factors, of the, if it's CAPRAM, because CAPRAM in itself, uh, it's a strange, very strange exercise. It's a very strange exercise because it was the first general equilibrium theory, but uh, it has the strange consequence that everybody invests in the same portfolio. Now, Olsen and, uh, um, demonstrated in 1974 that in this case, if, you, if the uh, fund separation theorem works, that is to say, everyone invests in the same portfolio, then prices are collinear. That's obvious in a sense, no? Because there is no, no trading. I mean, you invest just in the market portfolio. Now, prices are not collinear. Despite this, and this is one of the illustrations of what we said before. I mean, really, uh, I mean, in the hard science after uh, knowing that a model like CAP M cannot be true. I mean, they've been forgotten. Instead, thousands of articles have been written. So, in reality, you don't have CAP M, but you have a single factor models. Now, a single factor model is a gross. Let's, if you want approximation of reality, you have just one single factor, might be the principal component, might be something. But understand that these are, let's say, static models. You regress the return of a company on the model on the, say, at the same time. If you want a dynamic model, then you have to go into dynamic factor models. But dynamic factor models, you have a problem that you forecast. And so you regress returns today over factors yesterday or the day before. But then coefficients become very, very small to the point that they're not significant anymore. And then there is lots and lots of different ideas. For example, you can apply principal components analysis. You can take a number of principal components. You can use VAR on the vector autoregression models on the, on the principal components, and then forecast returns. This is what they do, for example, at the National Bureau of Economic Research, the methodology of Stock and Watson. But it's something very delicate. But let's understand that uh, something done that you have Every, every time you have to, to know what will happen in the future. Also, uh, um, okay, so nothing. We'll come back to it later. Now, that the, the, the important point is you are Will, as, as your real interest is for forecasting, essentially you're betting on, my, on mere reversion. You're betting on the idea that uh, somehow prices will revert to some type of mean, to some type of fundamental value, to some, some type of, uh, of mean. But that's a very difficult thing to prove. Um, um, every time they try, I mean, there are, when you try to, to understand uh, mean reversion, I myself I mean, worked on, on, on this subject, and finally we produced a, a model where uh, we essentially introduced the, the idea of uh, uh, factor models of pricing instead of returns. Because prices are more, carry more information than returns, because there is a level, an information about level. And essentially we proved that in a large market, uh, essentially you have just uh, one integrated factor, so one factor that behaves as a random walk, to, to, be, to be clear, and plus... Uh, um, stationary factors. Now, that is what creates mean reversion, but creates a relative mean reversion. Mean reversion relative to a stochastic trend, something that really you cannot forecast. But you can essentially produce long, short, uh, let's say, strategies. Now, the strongest formulation, going back to ratio, the strongest formulation of the price to earnings principle or any other ratio that you want to apply is that states that uh, there is a, an intrinsic natural ratio between the price of uh, stock and its earnings. But then you have again to the same problem. Um, determining a natural PND price to earnings ratio is aching to determine a natural interest rate. And there might be First of all, there might be changes, real changes. For example, 
there is a, an interesting article that shows that uh, in the last, uh, if you compare, uh, let's say the earnings, uh, the, the, the earnings of companies up to 1997, and from 1997 to now, um, the returns, I mean, the, the, the earnings of companies has increased by something like 60, 70 percent. And this is due to a number of things uh, that are different, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, essentially lower salaries than one say, and one thinks, I mean, there is much, much more profit. So it might be that the price to earnings ratio has a change, a fundamental change that does not really revert to a, to a mean. And in any case, how do you determine the mean? How do you determine the natural, let's say, ratio between the price and the earnings? And uh, um, if you look at the, at the data, the cross-sectional average, uh, for example, for the P&D, for the S&P 500, for the 146-year period from 1980, 71 to 2017, had a mean of 15.64, with values as, as low as 531, as, as high as 123. So, what is the, what is, I mean, do you, can you really say that there is a mean, or you are in the presence of something which is intrinsically non-stationary? I mean, it's a very, it's very uh, difficult to believe that uh, you have a stationary process with such uh, huge uh, changes in, uh, in, uh, in, in values. And so, using the P&D to forecast uh, future price movement is questionable because really do not, you do not know if. Uh, um, it's mean reverting, and if it's mean reverting, to what, to what value it's mean reverting. And uh, <coughs> that's an interesting comment by Graham Dodd, by, by Benjamin Graham. The concept of future prospects, uh, in particular continued growth uh, in, in, the, in the future, invites the application of formulas out of higher order mathematics to establish the present value. But the combination of precise formulas with highly imprecise assumptions can be used to establish or rather justifies practically any, any value. That's always the same problem. If you use a complex mathematics with lots and lots of different parameters, basically on data that are non stationary, that are different, I mean, you can justify anything. It becomes ideology more than, than science. Essentially, as uh, uh, Stephen Penman said, valuation models are not for valuation in the sense of, of science, are not for establishing intrinsic valuation, but essentially a game against other investors. So, valuation is challenging the market price. It's challenging what other investors will, 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 will essentially value as, uh, as, uh, as price. Um, there are a number of comments that we uh, what drives valuation? What are the real drivers of valuation? Um, let's say there are a number of uh, uh, these uh, good article and McKinsey consultants said the growth rates and multiples moving lock steps only when combined with health returns on invested capital. I mean, it's it becomes very difficult to establish any sort of causality, for example, the sense of a danger of, any, of anyone. Profits drive uh, stock prices, uh, yes, but uh, um, expect the resale value drive stock prices. Um, it's, it's very difficult to say what really drives uh, evaluation. So, in the end, the question is, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, methods, uh, lots of uh, considerations relative evaluations, but uh, as we see, there are problems in intrinsic price to predict prices, so there are problems with the, price, the time to, to, to reversion, the stability of uh, intrinsic values. Do they have predictive power? I mean, can we really say that uh, models, that uh, uh, valuation models have intrinsic, have intrinsic have, uh, predictive power? But present value, mo according to Eng and Beckert uh, in 2007, they found that uh, valuation models have some short-term predictive power with the short rate as the, the best predictor. Relative valuation models have uh, predictive power, but uh, confidence in the signals only if mispricing are extreme relative to the models. I mean, you can really use, uh, relative, you can use uh, these models only if uh, you have very strong, uh, very strong deviations. I mean, otherwise, in, uh, in market con different market conditions, uh, 
Um, so in the end, uh, uh, price to earnings ratio are believed to have only limited medium to long term predictive power. Uh, again, there are, uh, it's, it's questionable, the old questions, if uh, evaluation models are effectively able to predict uh, markets, uh, in general, the question of their predictive ability, of, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a non-solved non question. Uh, of course, Barton Malkiel said no. I mean, he's the one who introduced, I mean, he's, uh, the, the idea, that, I mean, he, he championed the idea that markets are essentially efficient in the sense of being unpredictable. Um, there are lots and lots of studies that try to understand if markets are really predictable or if predictability is more or less uh, um, random. Uh, the fact that active managers essentially are unable to produce uh, much more return than, uh, the, the, let's say, the passive investors in a sense, uh, is a uh, confirmation that it's very difficult uh, to predict the uh, market. And so, I mean, the, the questions were prices will return to some historical mean. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very, very difficult to predict. I mean, as, we, as I mentioned before, we created models where prices uh, effectively are mean reverting to a stochastic trend. We created the model, we created the strategies, strategies show very large, large returns. If you want, this is also quite uh, intuitive. If you take, for example, you take a market like SP500, and you take the, st the standard deviation or the variance, if you want, of the cross-sectional prices, if markets were really unpredictable, and if markets were really uh, random walks, then you have a certain type of, which can be predicted theoretically, of growth of the cross-sectional deviation. Actually, if you really look at what happens in market, you see that the standard deviation of the cross-sections of prices of large markets is almost constant, with sometimes a jump that might signal some sort of regime shift. Based on this idea, we created this model where and we use lots of different uh, statistical techniques to show that basically you have only one integrated factors and all, all I mean we use prices instead of, of returns so we created factor models of prices where the price is driven by other prices uh, sorry by the prices are driven by factors and essentially the conclusion is that uh, you have one integrated factor for a large market like the SP500 we have one integrated factors, all other factors are uh, stationary. And this is what created, uh, creates essentially the mean reversion because stationary factors go, go back. But of course, nothing is written in stone. Uh, these are statistical, um, statistical findings uh, relative to a certain period which are relatively long, but still uh, relatively, it's, it's not very, a very, very long period on, uh, on, on, a real, on a real economic scale. The problem is that you might have uh, changes of uh, uh, regime changes of different types of different nature. No. Okay, now IPOs. Uh, before we leave the, this subject, let's mention that uh, there is another idea about, uh, uh, still on the idea that uh, valuations, Absolute valuations are related to macroeconomic uh, uh, notions. There is what is called the Buffett ratio. Uh, Warren Buffett, I think that everybody knows Warren Buffett, some a few years ago during an interview said that the best value, the best uh, predictor, the best uh, indicator if markets are over or undervalued is the, uh, the GDP. So there is uh, in a, in an idea that uh, essentially the best uh, way, I mean, if you really want to predict, if markets are overvalued or undervalued, okay, you can use the natural rate of interest, but another idea is to understand the evolution of the capitalization of markets with respect to GDP. The whole idea is that in the long run, uh, the capitalization should grow as much as GDP. You cannot have uh, markets that uh, grow, 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 and the GDP remains small. Sooner or later, you have, you have a problem. 
which might be questionable given all the changes that are actually going on. But I mean, that's uh, if, you, for example, if you plot the SP 500 and the growth of the U.S. GDP, you say that you see that effectively over <coughs> the period, let's say from 1947, again you go to the Federal Reserve and you find the data over a period, let's say, of 40, 50 years, effectively the GDP is kind of uh, it's the mean of uh, of the, of the market capitalization. But uh, with huge, actually, you have something like this. Crime is definitely not for small people. <laughs> Thanks. If you, if you plot the GDP, you have something like this for a long period. And then like this. If you plot the SP 500, you have something that more or less follows. Then you have first growth, and then uh, we'll keep on growing. Who knows? Um, we tried, I mean, it's one of the subjects, if you want, of, uh, of my personal research effort to understand if we can predict somehow the, these returns, if we can predict uh, these shifts. Using, uh, well, essentially, we try to use uh, as predictors um, the market capitalization, so the word, the Buffett ratio, but in addition, data related to finance, such as, for example, the percentage of profit. Uh, the, sorry, the percentage of financial profit in the global profit of the SP500. Because the more you have financial profit, the more risky situation you have. No, so we are trying to, I mean, I, myself and, and uh, co co colleagues, I mean, we are trying to predict, uh, and we are trying to model these effects uh, using um, phenomena, using data such as uh, um, effectively, not only market capitalization as in the Buffett ratio, but things that effectively try to uh, show the effect of the money generation process on, uh, on, on financial markets. We are thoroughly convinced that much of what is, I mean, what hap is happening here, on one side, um, real economic, uh, uh, let's say, structural changes, such as, for example, uh, salaries. I mean, now, sal I mean, <laughs> On the other side, you have uh, uh, increasing concentration, which means that, uh, going back to what we, I said before, many of the, of the variables that we are currently using in understanding finance and economics actually becomes relatively uh, not usable in a situation of a complex market. For example, take inflation. Normally, I mean, you consider growth theory, in growth theory, you have uh, nominal growth and uh, real growth. Today, it's not really uh, very meaningful because what you measure as inflation is what they call Jodo inflation. So the inflation applied to a panel of goods that are consumed by people like me. But the real growth is concentrated in the very small uh, sector of the population, and these people do not consume products that are subject to inflation. So actually, when you introduce uh, the distinction between nominal and real growth, you're introducing something that does not really apply in a highly unequal world, in a highly complex world. No, and this uh, uh, it's what, so in trying to explain all these phenomena, we have effectively to consider all the financial phenomena, all the, the problem created by the generation of a huge amount of money that injected in the economy. The usual, I mean, the, the idea of the, the Friedman and the Irving Fisher of the quantity theory of money, that there is a, it does not work. But it does not work essentially because uh, money is not uh, injected uniformly in the economy. So you cannot have really a ratio between inflation and the, the amount of money. You have really to understand that there are segregated flows of money, and this is what drives uh, these, uh, these processes. If you are interested, there are other studies, other ideas uh, uh, relative to, but more mathematical, relative to how when price, for example, there is a group uh, at the ETH that tries to understand if uh, 
you can predict crisis based on a certain type of, uh, of fluctuations. Okay, uh, there are many different, different ideas. For me and for the group that works with me, financial phenomena, the process, essentially the process of money generation, the distribution of the money created is a fundamental, it's a fundamental issue. Um, okay, talking about IPOs, again Warren Buffett uh, once said that uh, if, you'd, uh, run a, if you were teaching a finance course and you ask students uh, to value IPOs, you would flank anyone who comes out with an answer, because it's basically impossible. Um, there are a number of uh, studies, 72% uh, for example of the IPOs issued in 2015 were trading below the issuance price a year later. Uh, you have a very strange uh, situation with IPOs like SNAPS for example, I mean, companies that in principle nobody should invest in, I mean secrecy, everything, and still they come out with lots of, of money. Uh, the average return for a 2015 IPO stock issue in the States was minus 19%. So, um, when, you talk, when you go into IPO, so initial public offerings, you have the same evaluation, you have the same problems that uh, you have uh, with uh, discount dis the dividend models, discount cash flow models, or of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, ratios. The problem is uh, that because essentially the companies are the same, I mean the ideas are the same, but you have much less information. These companies are not subject, I mean we are not subject before the actual uh, IPOs, they were not subject to uh, controls on, uh, on how inform on the information, so you have lack of reliable information, so you have information asymmetry, I mean the one who wants to, to go an IPO knows more than, than the investors. Um, you have the problems with information sources because very often there is a lot of hype. I mean, these things are highly publicized. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a hurting phenomenon is created. Um, there is a role, the role of investment banks in price discovery is important, uh, but clearly it's uh, subject to optimistic biases. So it's, it's, a, very difficult, it's a very difficult subject. Well, we have already uh, discussed uh, the uh, dearth of shares that is now uh, due to corporate buybacks and due to, to the fact that many, com many, corpora many corporations essentially merged. Actually, the number, the actual number of, uh, of uh, stocks available in the U.S. market is shrinking, uh, which is, uh, creates clearly problem for, for valuation. But uh, what is really important to understand is the role of central banks, and which is a neglected. I mean, it's very difficult to find uh, sources that uh, try to understand because the role of, for example, quantitative easing, in the on, in the, only in the US market, uh, it has injected $4.2 trillion of quantitative easing. Now, this money does not, has not reached the, 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 the real economy. It's money that has been, I mean, through quantitative easing, the central banks buy assets, and so money goes to those who had assets. And this money continues to circulate uh, in, the, in the financial markets. It, none of this, mar of this money has reached, uh, really, the, uh, the, 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 the real economy. Okay, there have been <laughs> complex phenomena, but by and large, uh, the money created through quantitative easing, which is really money created out of blue sky by the central banks, as, and it's not negligible because you're talking about $4 trillion, has remained in, uh, in financial markets. Now, clearly this money has created a huge demand for, for stocks because, and as uh, is probably what is uh, behind uh, this uh, part of the increase in things such as the SP500. Actually today, because I mean, Central banks uh, have begun to say, no, we cannot keep uh, this type of situation. So they are reducing. I mean, the ECB has uh, already half the, 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 the purchase, uh, the monthly purchase of, uh, of, uh, of bonds, of, of assets. Um, the, uh, it's not clear what the Federal Reserve will do, because in a sense, if they withdraw the four trillion, so, which means that they sell for a trillion dollars worth of, of assets, clearly the market will have a 
to be a crash. So they try to do it somehow, try to reduce uh, somehow their, their holding of, uh, of, of assets, and so the money, that they try to reduce the money that they've injected in the, in the economy without producing effects that are too, too negative. But of course, I mean, the market, markets are very sensitive to anything related to, to, to this type of... Just understand that, for example, in Japan, the Bank of Japan owns 30% of the stocks. It's the largest single shareholder. It's almost a state economy. No. It's a private state economy. They hold 30% because with quantitative easing, I mean, they buy everything. They buy <laughs> bonds, not only state bonds, but corporate bonds. And not only corporate bonds, but then they buy uh, <laughs> assets like, like stocks. So uh, understanding this is probably one of the most important uh, phenomena that uh, one should uh, really uh, study for understanding valuations, but uh, it's a relatively neglected phenomenon. Anything which is related to the banking system is neglected in finance, because finance is based on models where markets clear instantaneously. Look at any model, look at any financial model that you can find in uh, markets clear. There is no idea of uh, methods of mechanism that generates money, that creates money, and so they create distortions in this market. Still, these distortions exist. And so, for example, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratios is now above 70% above, above its historical average. And uh, this is due, I mean, now this is due to many different factors. Some of these factors are real factors in the sense that uh, are relative to the fact that co corporations earn more money than before. But uh, the fact that corporations earn more money than before is also due to the fact that people, uh, that the salaries, I mean, people, the salaries have been essentially in the last 20 years not growing. But to, and actually they have been going down. But to keep, uh, a certain level of uh, um, consumption, people are growing, the, the, the indebtedness of people is growing. So today you have a general public who is much more indebted than, let's say, 20 years ago. You have corporations that sit on huge piles of cash. You have salaries that are reduced. So you have potentially a very dangerous situation because at a certain moment, uh, this debt has to be repaid. And one of, for example, one of the first uh, uh, crisis, potential crises is effectively the $1.5 trillion in uh, students' loan. Students' loan, we are taking on the assumption that uh, leaving university, you, you make uh, your immediately your $200,000 in salary. Now it's no longer true. And so there is a huge amount of loans and the reduced ability to repay these loans. Now, uh, all these things have been analyzed uh, theoretically, but uh, are totally outside of the mainstream. I don't know if you are familiar with the name of Hyman Minsky. Hyman Minsky is the first uh, who really un understood and the first uh, provided the, 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 the insight that econ an economy based on credit uh, is unstable because you can create uh, uh, demand that is based not uh, on real returns, not on real, on the real economy, but on future, um, let's say, on the future value of assets. And this is what happened, for example, in 2007. 2007, I mean, the huge amount of uh, money was lent to people under the assumption that the value of houses would have increased in the future. No? And that's the typical, the typical situation, so at a certain point there is what is called the Minsky moment, where people cannot repay debts, and then there is a cascade of effect, and it's what happened here. No, because then I mean, you, you have to sell, then the margin calls, uh, and all, all these type of things. So these uh, phenomena have been analyzed. Have been analyzed. There is this kind of theoretical analysis, started with Hyman Minsky, but by now it's done by several other but it's too much outside of the mainstream. Still, from the point of view of finance, it's very important to understand that there, has, there are important uh, um, instabilities in financial markets. 
due to the fact that it's an economy based on credit. Uh, that's, a, that's a critical point. Uh, I mean, it's an economy where money is created on credit, except the money which is created as uh, uh, quantitative easing, which is uh, uh, essentially created by the central banks. But it's money that comes and goes because that goes and comes because I mean, it's uh, it's in a sense it's perceived as uh, too. Uh, not, not market economy, not free market economy. I mean, as in Japan, I mean, in, in, in banks. And so market, I mean, money is created on credit, but credit must be repaid. And if uh, there are not enough uh, wages and earnings, I mean, to repay credits, uh, you arrive at the Minsky moment and you, and you have the crisis. So, I mean, for the point of view of uh, uh, financial markets, that's something absolutely fundamental. Uh, okay, that's uh, the, the, the other point. I mean, uh, that's more uh, kind of uh, eco real economic uh, economic situation. Lots of companies disappeared uh, from a high of more than 8,000 companies in 1994. We are now at 4,300 in 2016. Now, this is uh, true only for some economies. If you go on the Federation of uh, Stock Exchanges, you see that other regions. Uh, uh, do not have the same phenomenon. No. So, but actually, if you take what is the, in the end still the largest market economy, which is the US, where most of the investment go, etc., now you have a dearth of, uh, of, of stocks. I mean, the number of stocks has, uh, has gone down, has been going down. So in the period, for example, 2009-2016, U.S. corporate buybacks of 3.54 trillion plus dividends of 2.4 trillion pumped in the U.S. stock markets. And all these are purely financial phenomena, purely phenomena created on, uh, on, on money. And <laughs> as uh, this uh, person, Edouard Yardeni, said the bull has been on steroids <laughs> from share buybacks and, and, corporate, uh, and corporate managers. So, um, determining if uh, really the market is overpriced or underpriced, if there is, a, it's an important macroeconomic problem. It's not just a problem that can be solved uh, at the level of finance. It's not a problem that can be solved with the judicious uh, analysis of uh, cash flows. I mean, it's a macroeconomic problem. It's a problem of the entire structure of the economy. The, it's a problem of how the economy is structured, how the economy, how money is injected in the economy, how markets uh, are structured, and, and so on. Um, in the long run, clearly, the market and uh, the, uh, the economy should move uh, in... Uh, should, should move together, but in the short run, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, where well, the short run can be 20 years, <laughs> it's not, it's not necessarily true. No. Well, I mean, there are lots of uh, criticism of this uh, simple Buffett ratio, but as I said, I mean, one can create, I mean, we are working on it in terms of research, one, create, uh, one can create uh, much more sophisticated uh, models where you take into account not only simply the amount, the, the value of the market, but you take into account the real structural phenomena in the market. For example, the share of uh, financial profit uh, to, the total, to the total amount of profit. Just uh, remember that at the height of the crisis in 2007, 45% of SP500 profits were financial, which means essentially a Ponzi scheme. Before closing, I mean, there are a number of, I mean, one of the important considerations, and it's important I mean, for CFA, <laughs> it's do we, need the do we need fundamental analysis? I remember I was at uh, the uh, ceremony in New York uh, for, uh, for bots, you know, and uh, one of the questions was effectively, do we need uh, fundamental analysis? That's very important for, I mean, a group of people who are, in the end, financial analysts. And the answer is yes, of course. I mean, if uh, every model is simply a trend-following model, you create uh, huge instabilities. No, I mean, if, uh, let's say, suppose that every model is a, 
uh, factor model. Every model is uh, a kind of autoregressive model or whatever you might use. Uh, essentially, anything that takes the past, uh, say, the past patterns and extrapolates to the future, the market becomes extremely unstable. So you need something that somehow fix the relative value of stocks. Because the global value, as we see, the global value is essentially related to the global demand for, stock, for investment. So the global value is a macroeconomic problem. How much demand there is, and this, um, this demand is determined by a number of considerations, in particular by the amount of money generated. Inside, how do you determine the relative value? You need something, you need some, some mechanism that creates a, a devaluation based on analyzing companies. The question mark is how much? Today, I mean, roughly, uh, I'm not sure that I have the, the, the advanced data, but uh, um, a lot of uh, investors go to index investing. They simply follow the trend. Of course, it cannot, it's not possible that everybody goes into, into, into index investing because, I mean, some, some, some portion. The question is how much? And it's not an easy question to answer. It's not an easy question to answer how much real valuation do we need to make relative, relative valuation. Um, it's, a, it's an important question because the, the question is if you don't do any, I mean, if you don't do any valuation, then the markets become absolutely unstable and, and crazy. If you do too little valuation, then you have uh, huge profit opportunities. And this might again create strange market phenomena, no, because people uh, go and follow, I mean, uh, they, they become exaggerated by the, by the trend followers, but really try to model these facts, trying to understand uh, how much uh, of, uh, of how much valuation, how much real un understanding of the market you need. It's a question that is being um, analyzed by some academics, but there is no, no, real, no real answers. Just a ballpark that uh, at least you need some 20, 30 percent of the market. Uh, to be evaluated with real analysis of companies. But whether this is really true or not, nobody knows. Now, is there any change, any future changes? That's a difficult question. If you read uh, uh, the literature, but especially if you read the news, uh, you find all kinds of uh, uh, new, new ideas. Today, the name of the game is artificial intelligence. It seems that with artificial intelligence, uh, everybody is solved. My personal view is that we should be careful not to adapt to, adapt to humans to machines instead of adapting machines to humans. Now, anybody who has uh, to, uh, to interact with the calling center knows what, what it means. I mean, now you could, I mean, if you interact with an individual, you can ask an intelligent question. If you, are, if you interact with the, only eight possible answers, I mean, either your question is one of the eight possible answers or your question remains unanswered. So uh, we are facing the real problem that in finance, but in all kinds of, of life, we are going towards a, a simplification, artificial simplification, to make artificial intelligence sufficient to, to, to understand phenomena. And that's a very important, very bad phenomenon. One of the questions that uh, today uh, anyone working on investment, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the question is robotization. I mean, uh, how much is it all, you know, how, how much is robotization and automation going to impact uh, uh, the economy and markets and what will, will, will happen? The problem is, uh, um, and there are, if you read the, 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 I mean, the literature and newspapers, there are a number of people who seem to, to, to believe that uh, automation is a kind of natural phenomenon that will sweep the economy and there is nothing you can do. That's uh, the wrong answer. Not to be eluded, but uh, I mean, the use of automation is essentially a human decision. You can use automation simply to, to reduce uh, the number of uh, working hours, I mean, to, 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 to improve the, the life of people, or you can use automation simply to increase uh, the, uh, the profit. Now, this has another important consequence. In theory, I mean, Ford used to say, I have to pay st uh, workers so that they can buy my car. So in principle, a healthy economy 
should be an economy where people earn money and they're able to buy products and they're able to generate profit. So it should be a, something that, that works. If you begin to exploit uh, profit opportunities to the bonds and so that people do not, uh, sooner or later you don't have enough demand, which is a problem that is very strong in the US. Now, for a little while, this problem is solved through borrowing. People borrow, borrow to buy education, borrow to buy cars, but then they have to repay these, these, these jobs. So the future is something that has to be, to be, to be really understood. So if you, if, you, if you ask now what type of tools do we need to understand investment in the future, my personal take is that you need a real good understanding of macroeconomics. There are a number of uh, ideas, I mean, if, again, uh, understanding, I mean, th today they are saying, okay, we, can, we have now, a, of, now a, a huge amount of data. We can have data from uh, point of sales, uh, we can have data from satellite, uh, we can have data we can even analyze. Uh, I mean, every time you send an email uh, on Google, they read your email and you get this advertising. I mean, that's... Uh, but uh, uh, the final question is, uh, does it increase really the economy? The answer is probably no. Once everybody has exploited I mean, all the news that uh, there are in the world, I mean, uh, essentially it, it becomes, uh, it's not that the economy becomes bigger simply because you collect every data from, uh, from the point of sales. So again, I think that uh, fundamental, I mean, my personal take and my personal advice to anyone, especially anyone young that is uh, working in uh, asset management is really understand macroeconomics understand the economy, because if you don't understand the economy, you don't understand the real big phenomena that are behind assets, valuation, and things like that. Well, with this, I think I've closed, and uh, if you have any question. Hi. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you a lot about your presentation. It was really great structured and uh, very interesting for me as well because I'm uh, analyzing equities 24 hours per Sunday. <laughs> well, uh, I have uh, two separate questions, yeah? So maybe you will ask, uh, answer them uh, separately. Uh, firstly, uh, as I see, uh, as you know, the U.S. tax policy is changing now, yeah? And um, as I see, U.S. companies um, will reallocate their cash from the world, generally speaking, yeah, to U.S. And um, I guess the best way for them uh, is to push them, their money for buybacks. Uh, what do you think about that? And um, is or should Apple, Cisco, McDonald's, or any other corporates of, uh, that are the biggest uh, buybackers um, have some evaluation for these stocks. So, um, do they need some maximum for the prices of the equity to make buyback? How do you think about that? Okay, I will try to answer. Or, or they don't need this evaluation at all. They just need to put their money in the market. But you see, starting with your first question, okay, the taxation, the changes in taxation from uh, from the Trump administration, they risk to, uh, to have a very bad effect uh, in the long run because uh, they increase inequality, they essentially make uh, corporations richer and uh, people poorer. And this, in, it's difficult to imagine that this can keep on going forever. Uh, so, um, I don't know what, I mean, the real problem, what your, answer, your question is, uh, the real problem is that you risk today with the, the Trump administration, but essentially in the, the, this moment, what you really risk is a crisis. And the crisis will not benefit anyone. Uh, so, you know, it's... But, uh, but, he, but he asks companies to, com to money back from the world to US economy. Yeah, but you create an economy which is even more unequal even more artificial, because you have money that comes, 
you don't have a real economy working, you don't have employment, real employment, you have just uh, an increase, it's what, uh, what, what has been going on. I mean, the companies I mean, keep the money back, sure, and then what's, what, what, what's the advantage from, uh, from the point of view of the real American economy? or the economy of anyone. If, if you really, if the only thing you have is just money coming into the economy, you have something which is not beneficial, but it's detrimental to the economy. Because actually, the American economy is weak. Despite the, what you read in newspapers, despite what they pretend to do, in the end you have an economy that does not produce anything. They've lost entire sectors of industrial production, mainly semiconductor, in an in international crisis, I mean, they would really be without uh, semiconductors. They've lost uh, an incredible fraction of the car industry. It was a market that was difficult to imagine that uh, could be penetrated. I mean, they've basically left uh, huge companies. They've saved uh, the, 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 the financial, financial corporations, but they've left. Uh, so your question is, what should, should the companies do? Uh, my answer is that the, the, this tax should not be there <laughs> because in the long run, because yes, I mean, they can, they can buy back, they can do these things, but they will make the situation worse. They will make an economy more critical, more uh, with, by the way, today we are in a very dangerous world. You know, crises of this type uh, might end up with very bad outcome because when you really realize that your economy is, uh, is doing poorly and you are potentially, it's not true, but the largest uh, uh, economy in the world, uh, you might do things such as wars and uh, actually they have so many wars around. Um, it's a difficult question. I mean, when you, your question is uh, this tax break should not be there and corporations should not bring the money back because if bringing the money back will increase uh, financial, pure, it will be a purely financial, financial thing. That will not, I mean, they should invest in the real economy, bringing back not money, but production. If they don't do it, uh, they, they risk seriously a crisis, and if not, they might risk seriously something even worse. That's my answer. I might be wrong, of course. Yeah, I, I, I bought puts on semiconductors yesterday, <laughs> I know. <laughs> And the other question was, do, do such companies for the banks uh, need some uh, maximum value for their stocks? They should invest uh, in real things. I mean, the real problem... If they're doing this right now, they, I guess they think it's good for them, for stockholders, the major stockholders. No. They do really invest in, uh, in, in, in production. They do really invest in things that are beneficial for the, for the, for the general economy. I don't really see it. At least, uh, for, from what I can, I can see, they don't, uh, I mean, they try, they always try, there are a number of articles, uh, for example, there was an article by Sanjit, San, I forget the name, uh, on the, a, few, a few days ago, on the excessive short-termism. You, you want to create profits in the short term, and you have no long-term vision. I mean, they should really try to invest for, for the long for the long term. Take a company like Apple. They are in the end very fragile companies. They all continue to to, to bring the, the the name of, of their founder, and uh, but actually they are very fragile companies. They should also, in my opinion, they should also really become realistic. They try to lobby for more realistic. Uh, let's say, cultural changes, I mean, for more realistic economic situations. Because as, as it is today, economies are fragile, also because the patterns of consumption are very fragile. I mean, take, for example, the car market in the U.S. The car market in the U.S., I mean, markets was, I mean, if you look at the data, go to the data, uh, and you see that uh, it grew steadily, almost linearly, from 1947 up to uh, 10 years ago. Then it stopped, because, I mean, once you have ev one car, every 1.4 inhabitants, basically, uh, you know, you have one car for, for, for everyone. How does it grow? It grows with uh, cars that are basically not, not usable. When you have a car like the new... Uh, Cherokee Chief, which has a 707 horsepower and it can drive at 300 kilometers per hour as an SUV, you know that you have an object that is totally useless. 
So the, the, on the other side, you have an infrastructure that is, uh, that is crumbling. You have basically no infrastructure. So I mean, they should really try to, to understand that uh, they need an infrastructure. They need an economy that works. They cannot uh, continue to produce an economy based on uh, what uh, once, once were called the Veblen goods, things that you buy just because you have the money to buy them. But the value of these things is what I said before. I mean, you know, inf you cannot really measure inflation there. So you have a, a portion of the economy that is increasingly financial, with values that uh, have absolutely no... Jeff, I mean, the, 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 the balloon dog orange of Jeff Kuhn was sold for $58 million. It's just a little statue of, uh, of, of steel. You have an economy that is too much financial. That's, uh, that's my, my take of the situation. So they sh what they should really do is uh, realize that what they need, I mean, take the, the, the advice of Ford. Ford built cars and needed people to buy cars. So they need to manufacture something and also they, you know, you cannot, I mean, with the globalization the idea was, okay, we don't need an, an local consumers because our market is the world. And this worked for a while. But the market has become competitors that are potentially more... I mean, for example, people don't realize that uh, the U.S. has 300 million people. And basically, any increase in consumptions is increase in the quality of consumptions, increase in complexity. On the other side, you have China. You have 300 million people that more or less have reached the same level of, uh, of uh, consumptions of Europe. But then you have 1.1 billion people that need to be developed. They don't, need, they don't need foreign markets. It's like the situation I mean, of Europe or the US 100 years ago. So, I mean, one should really understand, I mean, the globalization, you know, the thing, they continue, for example, to put uh, production in China. They say, thank you. Grazie, grazie. <laughs> you know, but then, I mean, France wanted to sell uh, TGV. They said, well, no, by the way, our TGV is slightly faster than yours. Uh, France wanted to sell a uh, nuclear reactor. They said, well, no, thank you. I mean, we, our uh, nuclear reactors, I mean, have a little bit more advanced than yours. It's useless to think that you can really dominate the world. And they should really understand that what they need to do is to develop their own economy. And by the way, Europe should do the same. So corporations, they, I mean, if corporations keep on working on the, the old idea that greed is good, it's wrong. Greed is not always good. You really need, need a, view, a vision, a view. So corporations, if they continue to produce profits, which are largely financial profit, you have, you have a crisis. It cannot, cannot go on forever. The alternative is a medievalization of the economy, where essentially you create a, a work, and, and there are signs that we might go into this direction. For example, the idea of uh, where you create essentially a large numbers of poor <coughs> and a small number of international elite. No, like, uh, Louis <coughs> like uh, France under, under Louis XIV, no? Yet just the economy was built in the Versailles Castle, and the others were, basically. So, for example, the idea of helicopter money, the idea of giving money, basic money to people, is very bad, because it's a move in the direction of uh, having a mass of people that basically become useless, because with automation you don't need so many people, and on top of this, you have a layer of economy which at this point becomes transnational, which is essentially extremely rich. But where extremely rich means extremely rich. That's a political decision. Eh? So when you say, what should the companies do? My opinion is that they should really understand that if you go into this type of economy, you are not going to a nice world. But that's my opinion. I might be old. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. It was uh, very insightful and interesting. I have uh, another question. Uh, what do you think about uh, intrinsic value of uh, cryptocurrencies? For about example, of, of About intrinsic values of cryptocurrencies, for example, Bitcoin. Uh, do they have some uh, intrinsic non-zero value or they are only bubbles uh, stipulated by high demand and uh, will uh, uh, in the you know, at the end uh, decline in value to zero? Hundreds okay. of... Uh, hundreds of uh, 
the, uh, the currencies have been developed over the years. Perhaps, I mean, people don't understand that uh, only one survived, it's the Swiss Vir. And the Swiss Vir survived because we have a community of 65,000 uh, people and individuals that really work as, as, as an economy because they are Swiss. All other, all other uh, currencies have been killed by central banks. Now, cryptocurrencies, bitcoins or whatever, are just experiments that central banks let develop just to see what happens. But they, they can be killed any moment. I mean, they have, I mean, why should any central bank let Bitcoin become a real international power? There is absolutely no, no reason. So it's a bubble that will... Now, if you ask about blockchain, that's a different story. Blockchain might become an important technology. For example, Bank of China is, is trying to understand blockchain. I mean, the problem, but again, the problems are enormous because essentially you go from a two-level two, uh, two ledger, where there is the central bank plus the banks, to a one-level ledger where control is done by... And this has enormous uh, implications because, for example, you should have a bank account with the central banks. But again, uh, these are decisions that are made by the governments. I mean, I think that to believe that Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency has a life of its own, and just by the, 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 the force, the strength of the of Internet, it will become the international currency, it's very, it's very naive. I mean, there will be someone has made money on this, someone has lost a lot of money, but it's a marginal, it's a marginal uh, event that will disappear. And if you look at what is happening today, I mean, it's progressively being forbidden, for progressively being banned from, from most, uh, most places. Blockchain might be different, but I, I don't have enough knowledge to, to comment on this. But hundreds of, uh, literally hundreds of, uh, of currencies, even in uh, very uh, important moments, uh, for example, the VARA, that was uh, introduced in the moment, the, the, the highest point of the crisis in 1920, 1930, it was forbidden simply because the central bank didn't want to lose, uh, to lose the control. I don't really believe that anyone will, uh, will want to lose the, the control of, uh, of, uh, of the currency. I mean, having the control of money, it's understood as it's a very important, it's a very important uh, control of the economy. In the Middle Ages, uh, the, large the large trading companies, they had their own financial system. But then, uh, you know, states were much less powerful. Information was much less uh, developed. And so, in the end, these trading companies had, quote-unquote, lobbying cap capabilities much higher than, than today. Okay, my question relates uh, to the role of uh, analysts and managers in the context of... To the role of? Uh, to, to the role of analysts and managers in the context of uh, active and passive strategies. So before we, we used to have uh, the situation when uh, in active strategies uh, analysts and managers, they picked the uh, securities, assigned weights and uh, like actively manage the portfolio and in passive strategies they just put money into the market index. Then uh, value and growth uh, indices appeared and they could put money into growth stocks or value stocks and then sector indexes appeared and now we have smart betas and like dozens or hundreds of different funds of different like indices. Uh, and uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, don't we have a fact that uh, to ch choose those passive vehicles, uh, funds, ETFs, uh, now become like active management task when we have like factor exposures, dozens of factors, hundreds of factors, and to choose factors, to assign weights to these factors is like active management was before? No. Thank you. I mean, active management in the sense of... Uh, uh, let's say trend, f I mean, let's, let's divide. You have two types of active management. One active management is based on techniques of, uh, let's say, time series analysis, in a sense. So you, an you analyze the market in terms of patterns, pattern, pattern uh, understanding. That's active management, but uh, that does not create stability in the market. I think that uh, valuation and uh, fundamental analysis is here to stay. At the same time, I think that uh, some technology will change it. In the sense, for example, I said before, 
uh, you need to analyze uh, uh, thousands of, of balance sheets. Uh, analyzing thousands of balance sheets, you might effectively introduce some automation, some, some, some techniques. So I think that active management in the sense of analyzing companies is here to stay because otherwise you have huge market instabilities. At the same time, you have probably to slightly or yes, modify the, 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 the way it's, it's done. I mean, the, the, the old days where the, 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 the manager, the asset manager went to lunch with, uh, to dinner with the CEO, it's gone. Now you have to analyze balance sheets, you have to understand more macroeconomics, but I think it's there to stay. Also, I think that there will be, if the economy is going to survive, if economies like Europe are going to survive, you need corporations that are more interested in really doing something. So probably you need a better understanding, of mutual understanding of the financial teams at big corporations and the financial team of managers. Which, uh, which should be, in a sense, uh, um, more uh, synergic, in a sense. So something will change uh, in, the, in how things are, are going, in how things are, if you want, are, are practiced, but it's there to stay. I don't really believe in any world where, I mean, beta, smart beta, you know, it's just pattern, uh, pattern recognition. It's nothing, it's nothing that can really understand. You need someone who understands the, 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 real, the real stuff. So I think that's the, my answer. As, an, as I understand you correctly, you call um, buybacks as some very wrong thing or bad thing because companies should to invest part of their profits into expansion of uh, their capacity and uh, expansion of real economies. But as I understand, buybacks, it's not they put money into the black hole. They uh, repurchase uh, shares from their previous investors. And it's hardly imagined that in previous investors uh, get this money from their shares and put them just under their pillows. They can and I think they should invest this money into the other projects, into the other companies. And it's how for the market works. We transfer money through have its access to uh, um, other companies or even countries that have its lacks. As I understand, you make some statements that we should return to some more protectionist economies to um, protect our economies against the whole world economies. Because even we um, remember the situation with quantitative easing money uh, received by American company invests into offshore I mean into some East Asian economies that uh, lead to growth of world economies not maybe some particular countries okay <coughs> now this is I mean I can only give my personal opinion really really personal opinion that we are going towards a more protectionist world for me first of all we are already there uh, some, for example, if you take the U.S., some sectors are really sensitive that they would not allow anyone to, to enter in the market. But they are interested only in things such as military defense and, and things like that. They are not interested in the real economy of Jodo. I think, personally, that some protectionism is inevitable. It's a totally fake to believe that we live in a world economy where uh, we are all where the where capital seeks the most profitable way, you have countries where you can uh, work for nothing, no, you can exploit children, you can exploit, no, it doesn't work this way. Some protectionism in the sense that you put, you know, take the, the old times, take Germany, how do they apply protectionism? With the DIN measures, with the DIN uh, regulations. They said, well, okay, anything you want, but if you want to sell to us, you have to respect these, these rules. I think that you cannot really believe that we are part of the entire world in a world which is so different. I mean, I think that today it's, uh, sorry, but this becomes too much political for <laughs> perhaps. Uh, we are essentially all in the politically correct. No? So we believe in uh, uh, cultural relativism, everything is equal, etc. Now, if you really believe in cultural relativism, you don't believe in progress. Because if you are cross-sectionally all equal, vertically we are all, all equal. So there is absolutely no reason why you should have any, pro any, any, any progress. I think that one should be realistic. And uh, if you take jobs in places where there is absolutely no protection, jobs are, uh, how do you expect your economy to work? 
You are not interested in your economy. So somehow, now your question, your initial question was about buybacks. You see, the problem is, if the company buy back their stocks and then take loans to invest in new projects, fine. But if they buy back their stocks and do nothing, it's not so good. Again, uh, you, there is no way you can lo look at uh, things uh, individually. You really have to take a macroeconomic views. What we need today is an economy that works. We need an economy, again, for people. Because if we don't have an economy for people, the scenarios can be very, very bad with uh, wars, uh, violence, uh, etc. We need an economy for people. That's, uh, that's the key message for me. I mean, everybody, I mean, it's, it's sad. It's uh, many, many, uh, but uh, it's not what is done. But we need, again, again, that the economy works for people because people need to be, to earn money, to be able to buy things, uh, reasonable things, uh, and, and so on. So you need a reasonable economy with the strong cultural values. And uh, does it imply some protectionism? Yes. And uh, if you want to make economy more people, people economy, uh, is it need to government govern more? Sure. Oh, OK. Sure. By the way, uh, I tell always the Americans, you are in, fi in, in favor of small government and big corporations. You are essentially switching from one government to another. You need the government to do its, uh, its role. For example, you need the government to um, things such as uh, communications, um, basic uh, transportation. Why should they take Italy? You have now a train system that does not work. On the other hand, you have a small uh, lines like uh, Milan, Rome, that are privatized and they make lots of money. It does not make sense. I mean, an infrastructure that serves the, the, the country should, should work for the country. Uh, in Norway, for example, when they discovered the, 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 the oil, they, they created this fund and they improved the, the, the infrastructure. And that's the decision to be made. Thank you. Uh, Did you hear about Spotify trying to enter the making some kind of IPO without IPO? Did you hear about Spotify? They, they want to um, play the shares public placement, provide public placement, but without uh, traditional IPO, without road shows, without JP Morgan. Uh, Advisors, yeah? Uh, I don't hear? have an opinion, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay, so no question. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, for example, no, I don't, I don't have an opinion. I mean, the traditional method, as we have seen, is not particularly uh, effective. I mean, the, the traditional methods of the, of the more, uh, so in a sense, you can understand, uh, no, because, uh, but I am not sure that uh, a direct access to the market from IPO will be better. Frankly, I have no opinion. I think that these things uh, should really be understood technically and locally, having in mind that what you really want is a good economy.